and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Mr. Sidney Brownwood. Welcome to this, the second Lardy podcast. Tonight we've got an extended episode as Nick and Richard and myself are hitting the road on our first podcast road trip. So please excuse the sound quality as we've abandoned the Lard Island studio for the open road and we're on the way to Crisis, which is Antwerp's and Europe's biggest and best war game show. It's on Saturday, just a couple of days' time. And we're going to be there running games of Chain of Command and Sharp Practice. Um, but we've le- this morning we've left Lard Island very early and we're taking a couple of days also at the start to do a battlefield tour. So Richard, in the driving seat, very literally, can you tell us where we're going to be visiting over the next couple of days? I, I can indeed, Sydney. We're, uh, we're on our way to Belgium and we're heading primarily for the area of Ypres. And we're going to walk... Uh, surprisingly, uh, a 1940 battlefield primarily, which is the battle for the Ypres Communes Canal, um, which occurred 26th to 28th of May 1940. Basically, we've got a situation where the Belgian army is in a state of almost collapse, and the Germans have decided that they're going to swing to the west, are looking to cut off the retreat routes for the BEF and the French armies who are looking to fall back towards Dunkirk. If the Germans break through this canal line, then we're in big trouble. We're going to see huge numbers of British and French troops as prisoners of war. So Lord Gort has detailed the 5th Division with one additional brigade. So we've got three brigades of infantry sent to uh, defend the canal line. However, the big problem is it ain't a canal. It was built and they discovered that there was uh, a lot of issues with soil subsidence. So in many places the canal is is dry or at worst slightly moist. So we're going to be looking at that battle and we're going to be focusing specifically on the actions of one battalion who are up around Hill 60 which is interesting because Hill 60 was a really important part of the Ypres battlefield in uh, the First World War. So we're going to take time there to look at uh, several First World War sites as well, but primarily on day one we're going to be looking at the 1940 battle and we've allowed ourselves time on day two to do some of the real hot spots, maybe Messines Ridge, uh, Hill 60, Hill 62 of the 1914-18 war and as we discussed in uh, in the last programme we're going to see the point where my granddad uh, attacked with the 7th Battalion of the Northamptons um, on the 31st of um, July 1917 uh, and was wounded and that's a bit of a personal journey for me. So that, yeah. sounds, that sounds fantastic and I think uh, one of the things that we're going to have uh, as a theme for today, and in fact I think it's going to be our big issue, is going to be about battlefield walking. Yeah. Um, but before we do that, let's have a look at what we've been working on with our regular section, What's in the Workshop? Ooh. So Nick, what have you been up to? Uh, well, it's been quite a busy time for me actually Sydney. I've been looking at two main things I guess. Firstly looking at getting the game ready for Crisis. So we're going to be taking our sharp practice game. Uh, we're going to be lost in Muse Mystique uh, where we've got uh, Dr. Reg and his gang of, of uh, happy guys who are uh, rising up once again. So we've been working on some Napoleonic naval type guys to uh, take part in that action. We've got some some slaves, and some very nice figures there from Trent Miniatures that are playing the part of the mutinous slaves. Um, with some uh, mainly, oh gosh, a, a real mix of stuff actually against them, ranged against them from anybody from Victrix French, some of their lovely bicorn clad oh, they, uh, early they're, Empire they're, French. They're, um, they're assisting um, Armin de Mood and Mr. Reg, aren't they? The French have landed. 
to uh, to assist the uh, rebellious chaps uh, in the hope of uh, poking one in the eye for the Brits. So they're on the slave side, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. We've got the uh, the French taking the opportunity to um, cash in on the on the rebellion that um, Mr. Reg and Armin Demoud are leading. Yeah. So we've got um, some French colonial regulars, I guess you'd say. So these are guys. They're sort of bike horn wearing, stripy trousers, campaign dress, uh, and they look lovely and a bit of a sort of hodgepodge collection of Sounds things. like Sid on a Saturday night. So there's guys <laughs> there. We've got some guys there from Elite Miniatures. There's some uh, uh, Victrix in there. There's some Foundry in there. There's a real mix of, uh, uh, of stuff. It just gives it a lovely feel. So I'll be doing some of those under their, under their illustrious leader, the French uh, Gaspin Ferrer. Who's the uh, the asthmatic commander of the uh, of the battalion? Uh, so he'll be he'll be uh, making an appearance, and uh, they'll be up against a tough some tough opponents though because we've got some Royal Marines um, in there under Captain Roger Boys, and they'll be stepping forth with some Royal Navy chums. Um, so it promises to be a good game, and uh, just putting the things in place for that table really. So making sure we've got the right kind of trees and getting hedges out of the bag and that kind of stuff. And it's really nice when you're bringing figures together from lots of different manufacturers. Um, I know some people sort of take the view that they want all the figures from the same manufacturer and the same battalion. But I think when you're doing something which is you know, very small scale, like you know, the sharp practice type of game, it's really nice to have that bit of variety within oh, yeah, on the table. And, and it, I think within the same sort of unit company, because it sort of does bring out that sort of very sort of moving, vibrant sort of look of, of the units on the tabletop. Yeah, you yeah. want to be able to relate to these as individual people, really. And you know, if uh, you know, you may well have certain leaders in in your game of sharp practice, but you know, there might be there might be one figure who comes up from the ranks, and you just you know that figure has a particularly good game, and maybe you promote him, make him a corporal for the next game, and it's it's nice that it. The individuality of the figures imbues each each figure with, with their own character and personality to a degree. That's right, and you need some creative thinking there. It's nice to shop around. So if you go to some of the smaller manufacturers, for instance, they have some lovely character figures that, that maybe they're not sold as whatever it is you end up using them as, but they've got that perfect mix that just enables them to blend in. And, you know, figure sizes, people talk about figures being different sizes. To be honest, look at the three of us sat here. You know, we are all different sizes, and some of us some of us have got grotesque pr proportions. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm quite happy to bring that mix into uh, some of the figure battalions that we use. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm th actually, you saying that, I'm thinking of the, uh, I'm thinking of the figure that we use for the Comte de Langoustine, uh, the uh, French royalist officer serving Napoleon in uh, in a lot of our games set around 1813 with the French against the Prussians as the Grande Armée retires back, and uh, that figure was designed as a, a sort of pirate range figure. But he looks absolutely fantastic in his uh, white uniform and sash. I think he's probably about 32 mil. But uh, uh, as a as a leader, he really is a big man. So uh, it, it's it's a lovely figure, full of character. Um, uh, n not in the role at all that he's cast, but uh, uh, the, the the figure itself lends itself to. To, to allow you to develop that story, the fact that he's in a white uniform, you immediately think of a, a French royalist, uh, but you want to use him in the game in, in the Empire. Well, there, there were certainly cases of uh, nobility uh, of the uh, you know, ancient regime who were still there and still around once they got past the sort of uh, the horrors of the terror. Uh, they came out the came out the wardrobe and fought for the for the emperor. And this guy was obviously one of those individuals. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah, I think I think on that on that side as well. So the Royal Navy, for instance, um, my figures for that. Uh, gosh, I mean, I use them as Nelsonian in as much as they're Napoleonic guys. But I look at the figures that are actually in there. We've got everything from um, 16th century pirates through to. Uh, of late Victorian uh, Maori Wars figures, yeah. and possibly even some outside of that. So there's a real range. It's just it's just around looking at what what you see, what they're wearing. Can I get away with that? Does it add to the mix? 
and that makes it all really really um, yeah enjoyable and actually more fun I think because it gives you more rain you're not painting the same figure 15 times you're painting 15 different figures that's a big that's part of it fun. yeah, yeah a good part a big part of it so um that's yeah. 30 googly eyes is that right yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah thank you very much uh okay so and you said what else well the other thing i've been looking at then is uh, continuing the smuggler theme um i've been looking at all forms of transportation so this includes uh, various wagons um uh stage coaches or carriages and through to sort of mules and anything that can, you can carry a few sacks on uh, and again rowing boats and all kinds of stuff so I've got some I've got the Berlin carriage from Warlord that I purchased the other day which I'm looking forward to getting out of the box and having a go at putting together because it looks like a stunning piece of kit yeah. and I thought that would be sensational for so you could have a bit of a uh, bit of stand and deliver with that yeah absolutely I'm, I'm, I'm quite fancy some of that too uh, so that looks quite good fun and also I've been picking up some boats so rowing boats I picked up a, a lovely sort of South Sea Islands raft one of these rafts that's got like a float alongside it you know like a, oh, right. like yeah, a twin like a yeah, yeah. yeah which is absolutely perfect for um, Captain Cook in the South Seas so picking up any bits and pieces on that and I'll be looking out for more of that again a crisis have you got a captain's log I have but we don't talk about it <laughs> So Rich, how are you doing on your own workshop? What have you got um, which you're working on at the moment? Well, I've actually been uh, very, very busy uh, getting stuff ready for the game that I'm running at Crisis, which is a Chain of Command game, which, funnily enough, is loosely based on the battlefield that we're going to be visiting. Um, and I say loosely because I don't want to make too many decisions about the scenario until I've actually seen the ground that, uh, that uh, for, for, for first hand. Um, you know, there are issues, for example, with the canal, like how deep is the canal? I mean, I know in certain situations where the British were trying to withdraw across the canal, um, some of the uh, Bren carriers they used, in the, in the effort of going down the one side and up the other side, actually the engines burst into flame and they had to be abandoned. So I'm presuming that in places this is fairly heavy going. Anyway, the section that I'm running is doesn't have a canal in it. It's, gone up to the northern area a bit where we've got a railway embankment that's running through there so I've, I've had to build a railway embankment uh, kind of problematic uh, but uh, if anybody uh, has seen Lard Island News they'll see how I did it on there using some polystyrene coving which had turned upside down spread a bit of filler on top and then used a few little modeling techniques and some teddy bear fur to get that hopefully um, looking quite good. Um, I've actually, this is the first time I've ever used teddy bear fur. I've always looked, I've bought it several times and gone, oh no, that's horrible. It's the wrong, completely the wrong colour. And people say, oh, you can dye it and you can do whatever. But frankly, I think if you're starting with the wrong colour, it's just going to look like the wrong colour that's been dyed. Yeah, yeah. I did manage to get from uh, Dunelm or Dunelm Mill, as they used to be known, a moss green um, teddy bear fur throw for a bedspread. Okay. Um, a single bed, 10 quid, double bed, 20 quid. I didn't know they had the double bed one, I only bought the single bed one, but I'm actually going to go out and get the double bed one because the moss green is a fantastic base colour. Uh -huh. uh, and I combined that with a few aerosol cans. Oh, yeah. Um, so I used um, Army Painter British uniform, the khaki. Um, as the sort of base sort of mud colour, sprayed some patches of that on. I used um, some sage green aerosol gloss, which is designed for people spraying their garden furniture. Why you would do such a thing, I have no idea. Uh, sprayed that on a bit. Then I got a, 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 a yellow, uh, but it's um, not, not sort of buttercup bright yellow. It's more of a, a straw yellow type colour which I've used for a lighter dusting over it and using that combination it's actually come out yeah. I think really well uh, now I wouldn't use that to cover a whole table because to me I think it looks a bit too unkempt unless I was doing a game on Dartmoor or something like that maybe Hound of the Baskervilles but I, uh, what I've done is in certain sections I've cut that up to make fields yeah. uh, and, and just as individual fields that are sort of set aside as part of you know your normal process of crop rotation 
Um, they, I think they look pretty, pretty good, pretty nice. So I've been doing that. I built a fantastic boulangerie um, built by a company who I hadn't really come across before called Dark Ops. Um, they do quite a lot of various stuff uh, in, the, in the range of MDF buildings, a lot of it's sci-fi. And this is really the start of a World War II range. I mean, they, they say Normandy, but to be honest with you, you know, it's France, low countries anyway, Northern Europe. Um, and it's a great model because one of the things that I uh, dislike about MDF models is <coughs> Once you get an MDF model and you make it straight out of the pack and plumb it on the table, they become almost ubiquitous. You see so many games where the standard MDF house is featured. With these, um, and, and then you get to see sort of lugs in the roof, a bit like the plastic Waterloo farmhouse yeah, of, of our childhood. And I don't like that. Uh, what I like to see is uh, something that's a bit more three-dimensional. And this company really have come up with some really good ideas with the use of, of light cards, which you, you can pick off, rub away to expose brickwork under, underneath, which gives it that additional third dimension to it. And once you slap on a little bit of additional polyfiller, you're getting something that looks like a resin model, but all three internal floors are modelled, the doors open and close. So nice. Really, really nice model. And again, that's on Lard Island News if you have a look at that. Um, and, and just, and just as, yeah. as, as well, you're visiting the canal to yeah. sort of think about the depths. We should maybe visit yeah. a boulangerie, Nick. Um, and, uh, I, th I think that would sure be an excellent that idea, Sydney. In, in fact, I'm just account. making up my shopping list now for that. Pea manger tout les pies. But I think you're right. The MDF building sometimes they can look a bit bland, can't they? If they're not, yeah. if you don't put the effort in. Or the other, the other way of doing them, I guess, is to buy some that are ready made up. So, um, uh, shameless yeah. plug for ham and jam. So yeah, yeah. I've, you know, I'm uh, Jeff from Wales. Makes a great little range of, of uh, buildings suitable for Normandy and Northern France, uh, and they come ready-made. Yeah, so for yeah, lazy, lazy buggers like me, fantastic. they are absolutely spot on. Funnily enough, um, I was talking to uh, another uh, podcaster, a famous podcasting celebrity, Mike Hobbs. Uh, from Meeples and Miniatures who said to me when I was halfway through the build I, I, I look forward to seeing you uh, how you build this and I said well I'll, I'll give you a quick prelude uh, I said make it, paint it, go to the pub and he said actually he said, if you bought ham and jam buildings their instructions are even simpler yeah. it's just go to the pub <laughs> because they do come off the peg and yeah. I, I totally agree the ham and jam buildings are uh, absolutely incredible uh, and they've got all that texture already on them. I'm not honestly sure how uh, Jeff does that, but they are, for MDF buildings, you, you, you really wouldn't think they were when you looked at them. Yeah, and well, it's, it's, it's recognising the limitations of MDF that then allows you to use it to the maximum effectiveness. And you get the same with Charlie Foxtrot with their, with their Pantar roof range, where they say, yeah, no, I can't do Pantar roofs with MDF. So what I'm going to do is get a Pantar roof cast, and then the building itself is MDF. And that's, that's taking that and saying, right, MDF is good for these bits, but these other bits we need to do differently. And that's when I think MDF becomes a fabulous tool. How does he do it? Perhaps he's got a little bit of the Welsh wizard in him. <laughs> uh, I wonder why he was sitting like that. But yeah, um, it's, so that's what I've been doing there. Uh, I had to paint up another platoon of German infantry because I've, uh, I've got them and my German pioneers attacking. Uh, painted up a few additional British options um, for the game. So uh, I painted up some engineers when I originally thought I was going to have a canal involved, but now I'm not. <laughs> So, but they're always good to have in the bag. Um, so, can I, can I ask a question here, Rich? Because yeah. uh, you've got some figures on the some civilian figures on the go as well. Ah, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I um, I decided to uh, do some civilians because I think there are real there are some real issues with things like fifth column in 1940 mm. and the perception that uh, that there was a fifth column out there. So I painted up a lot of nice nuns. Um, from the West Wind Vampire Wars range, painted up some civilians from the Foundry Not Dad's Army range. I did a bit of head swapping there because uh, 
Uh, there's uh, you know, a British Bobby, which I've converted to be a French gendarme, um, and, <coughs> and some French civilians from Westwind. Um, I've also bought some uh, uh, very nice female civilians from Bad Squido Games, uh, who uh, they, they are releasing them at Crisis. So I haven't been able to get them painted up in time for the game. But really that idea that the civilians are there and the British need to be worried about, you know, could it be a German machine gun team? Could one of those bases of civilians be, you know, Germans attempting to infiltrate? So that just adds to the, the feel, the period feel of the game. Nice, really, some really nice figures there. And I had to, to make a few cobbles for that one, which was, again, on Lard Island News. How to make cheap and cheerful cobbles, um, and the answer is be very lazy and just follow the tips you get in there. But yeah, that's where we are. Okay, so let's move on to the big issue. Um, so our pertinent issue of the day is going to be battlefield walking. So what's in it for war gamers, and what tips can we give people? So Nick, let's start with you. What battlefields have you been walking over the last few years? Uh, a lot is the simplest way to answer that. I think <laughs> we've probably, I think certainly between Richard and I, we've walked the entire, uh, <laughs> Western the entire Europe. Western Europe <laughs> yeah, action line. <laughs> certainly, we've walked uh, Normandy from from uh, Cherbourg through to uh, Pegasus Bridge and further inland from there. Um, I was lucky enough a few years ago to do some battlefield walking around Mortan and the German counter-attack there, which is a really interesting action for lots of reasons, and maybe we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, uh, walked battlefields, of course we've done Waterloo most recently, we've done Great War battlefields, and I've also done battlefields around Operation Dragoon, which was the invasion of southern France when I was there on holiday. It's amazing how holidays seem to revolve around battlefields. There is a theme, and when my wife works out what it is, I'm sure I'll be banned from going on any more. Um, but they are, they're, they're wonderful places, but it's, it is about the research that you put in um, up front that makes them worthwhile. And what's the best way, do you think, for preparing? What's the best way of doing the research? And what do you need to think about before you actually step foot outside your front room? Well, you need to... Preparation, isn't it? The whole key yeah. is preparation. Um, I mean, we... Uh, Nick and I... I'll give you an example. Nick and I, um, a few years ago, uh, took, the, took the ferry across to Normandy. We landed at uh, Caen and uh, we basically worked our way right the way from uh, Sword Beach and Pegasus Bridge across to, to Cherbourg. Uh, and for that I got um, a load of French Blue Series, 1 to 25,000 maps. Uh, and that really has got to be the first, the first point. If you're going to go somewhere, you need decent maps. There's no good taking a, you know, a car atlas and thinking you're going to be able to work out what's going on. You've got to get a series of maps that are in one to twenty-five thousand, or you know, similar scale. For example, mm -hmm. coming to Belgium uh, for the battlefield tour we're doing uh, here, the, the the local maps are one to twenty thousand. Absolutely fantastic. Perfect. You really don't need to go down to one to twelve thousand, one to twelve and a half thousand, or smaller. You can, uh, if you're lucky, find some really detailed period military maps, um, but that's not entirely necessary. 1 to 20, 1 to 25,000 is absolutely fine. Although, having said that, the other thing I like to take with me is the period maps, mm -hmm. so we can compare what the what the troops who were fighting uh, had and compare that with the ground as it is today. So once you've got your map, you've started thinking about where you're going to be moving, where you're going to be walking. What about the size of the ground you're going to try and cover? Are you going to cover a small area? Or are you going to cover a larger area? Can what I do, just come in on that, that? Sid? Before, sure. Just before you go in on that, because one thing I wanted to add on the maps issue, mm. uh, and Rich is absolutely right, the French Blue series are superb, but you need to go online to the French website to buy them. 
So you, you might yeah. find it difficult to buy them in the UK. Point, yeah. But if you go online to the French, whatever they're called, the Institut yeah. Graphi, Geographie IGN, National IGN, or whatever, yeah, right. and buy them there, then that's the yeah. way to go. Sorry, Sid, I just thought it was important that people actually, should know point. where to find them. Actually, now you say that, I, the other place that I would recommend is a company called Stanford's in London, uh, who literally is a great big shop that specialises in nothing but maps. Yeah. For my Belgian 1 to 20,000 series, I... Uh, I could only find them at Stanford's. I couldn't find where the, the Belgian organisation that prints them makes them. But uh, Stanford's will tend to have maps for areas where people are, you know, going to go. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I, I mean, I have to say it's fairly obvious if you're going to Eep, there's a reason for Stanford's selling Eep. They're a London map shop. You are going to get lots of Brits going to Eep. Um, because of the um, you know the, the, the connections with the Great War. But what I was going to say about maps was um, is that once you've got your maps, don't just mark on there where you think the main places are that you want to go. But any information that you've got, you mark that on there. So, for example, when we went to uh, when Nick and I went to Normandy, <coughs> you've got the uh, the big German bunker positions named after mm -hmm. cars. So you've got Morris. It, which obviously we were going to go to Morris, but you've also got Rover and you've got all these Hillman and you've got all these other ones. So I marked all of them on there. And so when you're driving along this, this road going to wherever the hell you're going to, if you see that there's a little pink highlighted mark up, whether Blimin X that bloke going, thanks mate, I've no idea where I'm going. Uh, sorry about that, we are having fun driving on the wrong side of the road. Um, right, okay, so, uh, so we, you know, if you're driving up the road and you think, right, there's a little pink mark that I put on the map, there must be something there. Stop, get out of the car, put your boots on, walk 100 yards and see what you can find. And we found on a, a little French housing estate <laughs> um, a load of bunkers that were actually built on top. Uh, sorry, with houses built on top of them. They, 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 obviously, they decided that you, they couldn't blow them up and get rid of them. Um, and that was all part of trying to find out where Stan Hollis had been on D-Day. They make great sellers, I would think. There. And the other thing to add about the uh, the maps is, you know, you're going to write all over them. So mm -hmm. they need to be your maps. You yeah. need to be prepared to be able to mark them up. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be able to, you don't have to use sort of military annotations. You just need to be able to put something on there that you're going to know what it means. Yeah. Because you're going to ask us about books. And, and the thing about books is, of course, yeah, you need to do your research. You need to have extracts. But you know what? When you're on the ground, you cannot take all those books with you. It's not, no. it's not physically possible. So you might have them in the car, uh, but you're not going to have all of them in your rucksack. So your map is your living instruction manual, which you're taking with you, or your photocopy, or your scan yeah. of a map. Yeah. You're going to put your information on the map, and you're going to take that around with you, or one or several maps. Yeah, yeah, and um, you can't do it without the maps because yeah. you know, obviously, when you go somewhere, if you've never been there, you're trying to find your way around it. If you can't take a map with you, then there's no way you're going to be able to put yourself on the ground, sort of a hundred years ago for the First World War, or seventy years ago for the Second, because the terrain is very different. You won't recognise the features in the same way. Uh, what stuck out 70 years ago doesn't necessarily stick out now so you need to take the map and you need to mark what you're looking for on it. That's certainly true I and mean, one of the things that we found uh, that I found when planning the, um, the 1940 Ypres Commines Canal uh, battlefield war uh, was that you know you've got trees in places where there weren't trees um, in 1940 yeah. and it's important to know and to understand that because it, it's going to influence hugely the you know the, the battle. Um, so, take into account the differences between what was there then and what's there now. Um, uh, and also, I mean, I have found in a number of cases that the contour lines um, on some Second World War maps are completely wrong <laughs> when you compare them with the contour lines on modern maps. Uh, and so, it's 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 well worth you know checking that against a modern map to make sure you're understanding what's happening on the ground. But yeah, definitely, as Nick says, you are going to be uh, writing on your maps. I use highlighter pens. Uh, because you can actually, they're, they're transparent, the ink that they put on is transparent. That allows you to mark maps up whilst not masking the detail that's on there. The next thing is, draw yourself up an itinerary. Uh, you know where you're going to be starting, you know where you want to get to, you know the places that are there en route. Look on the map, draw up an itinerary that is sensible to allow you to maximise the time that you've got there. Nick and I did Sword Beach to Cherbourg in two days. We sailed out overnight. We got there at half past six in the morning. We were on Sword Beach on a cold, I think it was a November, wasn't it? Was it was November, yeah. Cold November morning as the sun came up. 
uh, <coughs> we swung across to uh, Pegasus Bridge and then right the way down um, covering uh, Juno, uh, Gold and Juno, uh, following the route inland of the uh, Green Howards and Stan Hollis who won yeah. his VC on D-Day. Yeah. Uh, now that's something important which I will come back to about following, picking a unit and following it. Um, but we then worked our way across the British beaches, we stayed in Baya overnight, uh, with then the next day we hit Omaha, we hit um, Samara Glees and all the outlying areas like Lafayette Causeway, uh, Chef du Pont, uh, the uh, Ost Truppen counterattack at Foville, and then we moved up to Utah Beach. Then we went up, was it Crisbeck, the battery up there? We did, we did, we did Crisbeck the as a veal um, as well. Yeah, there, and there's two we, or three batteries there that are well worth a visit. Yeah, and then we headed up to uh, Cherbourg, and of course, you've got. <coughs> Excuse me, the big fort there on top of the hill, you've got the German bunkers there as well. And and then we got on the overnight ferry the next night coming home. So we'd literally had uh, one night. And what, so one of the things I wanted to say there is that the, the um, one of the reasons we were able to do that so quickly was because we both done some of the sites before. So we knew exactly where we wanted to go and we could make a beeline straight for those. I wouldn't suggest that anybody doing it for the first time should try an itinerary or anything like that. And what about oh, that's true. what about not just using maps but also satellite imagery? Because I think that's another thing that you started thinking about. As yeah, well, I've been thinking about getting around. a satellite, but I can't quite stretch to one. That's interesting. That's a really good point, actually, because for the battlefield tour, the Eat Commons Canal, I use Google Earth, and the main thing I use Google Earth for was finding places where we could park the car for each stand. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a tour, 13 stands, 13 point. places that we want to go to, and we're doing it in two cars. Mm -hmm. Now the thing you've got to do is, can I stop there, or am I in the middle of a blooming motorway? So you use Google Earth, you have a look, where can you park the car, and then where can you access from that. Just doing that allows you to be prepared, and allows you to plan what you're going to do at each stand because you might find that you want to go to, to locations A and B but you can't get there but you can get to a place halfway in between so in that case you park up there and then you do a bit of walking so you need to know the points where you're going to have to put your walking boots on you need to know the points where you're going to want to have your binoculars on you uh, I mean I would suggest if you can take the field glasses and have them with you at all times that's fantastic but you don't always want to be lugging them about and there are times when they are more important than than not. Um, so use, certainly use uh, Google Earth to try and navigate your way around um, the battlefield before you go so you can spot the landmarks. So if you know you, you want to stop at that lay-by outside that house, you also know what that house looks like. <coughs> it does make it an awful lot easier. Um, yeah, keep your uh, objectives simple so as to enable you to um, see what you want to see and spend sufficient time doing so. Uh, I mean, Nick, Nick, this is just responding to what Nick was saying about you know not necessarily recommending the using the 48-hour uh, agenda that we use. <laughs> um, <coughs> if you've never been to Omaha Beach before, you want to allow a day to do it. It's not. You're not uh, you're not a tourist with your knotted hanky on your head and your and your um, uh, deck chair. You're going there to find out information. <clears throat> you want to find a book that is going to tell you where all the defences were. You want to find a map for the area and you want to mark those defences on them. Now, Omaha Beach is a fantastic example for that because the German Widerstand nest, the defensive positions that are there, <clears throat> are all. You know, every you know, you can find out where they are. You can go online and get that information, and then transfer that onto your map. If you can find a book that's going to give you specific information about that beach and those defensive positions, then read that beforehand. Don't take a book with you and think you're going to read it while you're there. You're not. You need to be prepped, and you need to have all that information. You know, already in your head or at least scribble down. Take a notebook so you can, if you want to put the letter X on the map for, for Wiederstand Nest number 32, then you can in your notebook write X and make you know half a page of notes that is going to tell you a little bit about that. Yeah, okay, there was a pack 40 there or there was a, 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 a this type of machine gun there, you know, for example in one of those positions they had a, a Polish 
um, version of the Maxim machine gun. It's just little bits of information like that. You'll find it a lot easier when you're, when you're on the ground to be able to refer to those notes than, as Nick said, lugging books about um, with you. Um, so give yourself time, get your map marked up, and then when you're there, just go and explore. Go and walk up that drive to that house, and if somebody tells you, just comes out and shouts at you and says, go away, then go away. But, you know, go and have a look round and see what you can find, because it, it's only by walking around and generally getting to know the ground and the area that you're actually really going to start to understand the battlefield and how it all fits together. Yeah. And in that process of, as you say, understanding the battlefield, yeah. what are you really looking for when you're on the ground? You've done your research, you've uh, read a couple of books, two or three, four books, you've marked on the map, you're there on the ground, big days come. What are you really thinking about? I mean, when you're looking yeah. at different locations, obviously, but you're thinking yeah. about more than that. Just give us some ideas of the key sort of things that are going through your mind when you're doing this. Yeah, sure. So you're on the ground. The reason you've gone there is to give you deeper understanding and a, and a perspective on the battle that you don't get from the books as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's so that you can actually stand, uh, you know, outside Hugomont and, and look at the size of the building and how impenetrable it appears. It's so you can stand on Omaha Beach and, and just breathe in that, what it must have been like to be there on that June morning. So it gives you that perspective. Um, you need to actually uh, be aware, therefore, that actually what you're looking at is not the same as what was there 70 years ago. You need to be very, very aware that what you're looking at is the modern landscape. Uh, so having an appreciation through history and through uh, through what's happened over the last 70 odd years gives you an understanding of, of where you are and what you're standing on. So you have to look kind of beyond that and, and be able to, is, it's a bit like when you go into a house you think do I want to buy it well um, not if it was decorated like this you have to look beyond the beyond <coughs> the sort of soft veneer uh, to what's really underneath it and some of that is the physical geography um, you know rivers don't tend to move very much um, but trees certainly do and land use certainly changes yeah. so being aware of that is really very important there are some places where that's less of an issue so for instance some of the villages um, behind Utah where the US Airborne were in action are almost unchanged from what they were in the war and they are brilliant brilliant places to go to oh. because you can stand oh. on a street corner yeah, yeah, and yeah. you can see down the road and this is one of the massive things that these battlefield tours give me as a war gamer is they make me understand that I am overly generous when I allow people to shoot at things on the tabletop because on the tabletop we allow people to shoot we say if you can see it you can shoot it and on the tabletop of course it's flat but in real life, it ain't flat. And so you can stand on a, on a corner of a road in Ho Fornell, um, just near St. Mary Glees. And actually, if you can see 30 yards in any direction, that's, 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 you know, that's your horizon. Uh, whereas on the battlefield, on the, on the tabletop, you'd say, well, okay, you can shoot to that 200 yards away. So it just enables you to look at the action in, with the eyes of the people that were there. Yeah, what, you know, what can you see? Yeah. from that church how far down that road can you see because on the map it looks like a straight road but actually there's a tiny kink in it which means visibility ends at 80 yards um, just the details like that allow you to get the perspective I mean one of the things that we um, really were lucky with was when uh, Nick and I went to Normandy uh, we uh, the um, the landscape had flooded we oh, went the murderer, yeah. yeah we went down the murder that's the name of the river we yeah. went uh, down to Lafayette Causeway and the fields were absolutely inundated as the, they were in uh, June 1944 because the Germans had allowed the you know water to uh, go out into the fields we went to Chef de Pont and the view across to Hill um, is it Hill 30? Hill 30 yeah across to Hill 30 Shabby. was exactly as it was in in June 1944, you simply can't understand Lafayette Causeway and, and until you till you go there, really, can you? And when you go there, you realise how blooming long it is. It's, um, it's, it is, uh, you know, if if I was going on a battlefield tour tomorrow, it would probably be the one that I put almost at the top of my list because it is so um, well, seemingly unchanged from what it was in 19 yeah. in 1944. Obviously, there are changes, but actually, you, know, it's, you get a very, very good feel of what's It's a confused action as well. And the other thing about being on the ground is that it gives you a sense of. I understand now a bit more about why it developed the way that it did because the geography and being here, you know, makes you understand that a bit more. Yeah. So you're thinking about 
lines of sight, you're thinking about terrain, you're thinking about access points. How do you then start to assimilate that into your raw gaming scenarios? or thinking about rules or rule adaptations. How do you synthesize all that in, in, into the hobby? That's I haven't a got question. a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Ask another one, Sherlock. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, 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 what you do... <laughs> what, well, where the bloody hell am Hang I on, going? I'm just Hold going through a, a right difficult interchange. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, OK. Well, what you, you what you can do, first of all, is when you're representing that action on the table, you, you, you understand the lines of sight, you understand what you can see from where, you understand, um, you know, what, where, where the ground is higher than, uh, than elsewhere. Now, you can see that from contours, but the thing about a contour map is you can get inundations on the ground which are never represented on a contour map because they're not within that sort of five metre boundary. But when you're on the ground, you, you realise, actually, from this position, anybody 20 yards in front of me is completely out of my line of sight. There's dead ground there because it falls away and then rises again. You, that's the type of information which you don't get on a... Uh, uh, which you don't get on a contour map even, but which you can then apply on the war games table. Sometimes you have to, um, sometimes you have to overemphasise some of these subtleties, um, which you know in reality may be only a, a couple of metres. But by overemphasising the, the the depth of a, a bit of dead ground, it it creates the effect that you're looking for. Yeah, I'll I'll, 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 I'll tell you what it does for me, Sid. Having taken a few minutes to compose myself <laughs> after your. After your question, penetrating. Yeah, question. Pen of course. It's, 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 it's like it's like being interrogated by the uh, uh, by the Stasi or somebody yeah. in, in that beanie hat. It's a, it feels like that. Um, it just makes your tabletops more realistic. Is really what it comes down to. It makes you spend more time on getting the map right for the action because you realise now how important that geography is in what went on on the table. So you really want to make sure that you have got those undulations in the ground. You really do want to make sure that you've got the right type of buildings in the right location so that they break yeah. up the line of sight in the right way. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the fundamental part of it, is that it makes your war games more accurate. And if you're using your war games as one method to help you understand the way the battle has unfolded, then, then, then it steps, steps you closer to that outcome. I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, one of the things that I, I enjoy about wargaming is it allows me to read about something and learn about an action, and then to put that on the table to try and gain a greater understanding of exactly what the issues were. And uh, you, you, can, you can do that just by reading the book. But what, if you go there, walk the battlefield, and really gain an understanding of what the ground's like, and you then gain an understanding of how difficult it was for um, for people to do certain, to undertake certain tasks or achieve certain objectives. Yeah. And you can then replicate that in the game. I mean, it's all gaming has to be fun. All gaming is about playing a game with toy soldiers and enjoying it. But the byproduct of that, the ability to put the battle on the table, put a game on the table, and play it through, and learn a bit about history, and gain an appreciation for, you know, the fact people say that uh, fact is stranger than fiction. To understand how these guys achieve such fantastic. Uh, ends. And, and if we're talking about Second World War, a lot of the games that we're playing in are small actions. Uh, yeah. And okay, so everybody's familiar with the map of the Battle of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Waterloo, you stand there, oh, I'm at Waterloo, I can recognise, there's Lay, so there's Moogie etc., etc. But for small battles, Sometimes when you until you until you get there, you, you've never seen anything. There, there's not a photo in a book. There might not even be a map. So you have to create this stuff from scratch. Uh, and actually, of course, what better way to do that than to go there and stand on the ground and to, to walk up to walk up the uh, the uh, the ridge towards the crossroads at Waterloo is to understand you know how steep how steep yes. that land is. Yes. To, to to move down to what was that farmhouse where they had the the prancing horses. Papalot. Buggering about Papalot. Papalot. To walk down towards Papalot through those sunken lanes makes you realise how troops would have to be channelled in down those roads. You look at them on the map, they're a road. You go there, you know that that is a sunken lane with banks as high as 20 foot in places. Mm. You, you can't walk up that slope. 
yeah. if, you, if you're on camera where you simply couldn't get up there, you are channeled down that 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 road because it's the only way to go. So when you're actually yeah, in the process of in the war games room, in the war games centre, or at home with a war games table. Yeah. Are you going to then tell the players and give them a little bit of this information to sort of set the scene? And also perhaps in the game itself, will you be reminding players that you can't access that road with um, two battalions get, trying to get into Papalot because they yeah. can't all fit at the same time? Yeah. Is that something that you're going to take over yeah. into the game itself? I think so, and it's important to try and represent that on the, on the table, just, to, just to, as, to act as an aid memoir. It's all very well saying, oh, that road there is through narrow banks. You've also got to, you know, Make make a make a, a a little bit of banking. I don't know. Cut up a bit of polystyrene and put some green flock on it, so they can see that they they would be channeled when they're going in there. But I think actually s saying about that in terms of relating this information to the gamers, one of the things that I I find really interesting is to not relay uh, the results mm -hmm. of the historical action to the gamers. Let them play it through on the table, and then say, okay, what actually happened was this. This is how this is how they undertook the attack. This is how the defence was set up. Good lord, I have never seen anything like that, that in my life. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a, a forty-foot-high <laughs> naked man at the side of the road cyclops, with well. cyclops with all bits on display. But uh, there we are. I suppose if you've got a statue of a small boy doing things in uh, in your capital city, having a, having a cyclops with an even uh, you know large bits doing uh, things at the side of the motorway is perfectly acceptable. It was certainly it's, unforgettable. Uh, it, it was, was certainly a remarkable. To Sydney, I think. Yeah. It was a gift offering to uh, the gods. Right. Fine. Okay. Moving so where, swiftly on. Where were we? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've certainly, you, you will know, Sid, we've certainly had games where we've said, OK, th this is this is how it all panned out historically. And that becomes a really interesting talking point because we can say, OK, that's r the reason I attacked like this was because of this, but I can really see what you mean about how they would do that. And the reason I set up my defences like this was because I thought this. Uh, and it's great to... Um, it's great in a way to have an opportunity to rewrite history by trying something different. Had um, had the guy defending the battery from you know Dick Winters and uh, the band of brothers, had he done something differently with his men, would would the battery, have, you know, would they've fought the the paras off or what? Yeah, yeah. And, and the other thing it also reinforces when you're on the ground is you know on the, on the tabletop there are edges and there are flanks. And actually, you realise that when you're on the ground, you know, funnily enough, the world doesn't end. You can, you, you know, the battlefield is in this area, but why was it that they didn't go off down that road and do, you know, what, what, why wasn't that field that's, you know, 30 yards off the edge of your war game table, why wasn't that important? How come the battle didn't stretch to there? Now you just get this interesting perspective of how the battle is placed in its physical environments. I sometimes find it quite hard, to be honest, to look at a battle on a map and then go to the place. And, I've, and what I struggle with initially is that orientation of okay, uh, it's 19 like we did like we did yesterday with the uh, uh, the battle on the canal. It's 1940. First thing I need to try and get my head around is where are the avenues of approach here? Mm -hmm. right, so where am I coming from as an attacker? Uh, and once you start to realise that that's the that's where you're moving in from, then the logic of how your troops move from that point becomes obvious to you. But it's quite hard, I think, when you first get your boots on the ground. Uh, because obviously there's not a war going on at the moment, not yet. Uh, so we can stand there and think, well, hang on a minute, what's happening and where? And just take some time to, to get your head straight on that. And that's quite an interesting contrast between a familiar battlefield like Gettysburg or Waterloo um, and a battlefield which is perhaps either smaller scale or which is just not really well known at all and yeah. may not even be signposted and that was a good example from yesterday. You've got people playing golf on a golf course which would have been a, used as a sighting place for a uh, a regimental battery from the Royal Artillery. You know, it's trying to sort of integrate, you know, what you know about the past and with the map into trying to get a result out, which is useful for wargaming. And sometimes, of course, you know, you're rewarded by the artifact. You know, you're actually there with the real thing. Mm. So uh, we went to walk the Cal Trail, for instance, earlier in the oh, year. Yeah, 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 and there's, um, you know, you read the accounts of the Shermans becoming. Uh, 
well not not so much bogged down as finding it impossible to get up the steep sides of the valley slope so you think oh yeah it's a steep valley slope and you go there and you look at the bloody hell this really is a steep valley slope just, and this guy yeah. tried to take a tank down here yeah. and then you go around the corner and what you find of course is there's a what is still embedded in the trail is uh, a thrown track from a Sherman yeah. that's, that's still there, still there 70 years later yeah. and it's those artifacts you can, you can almost touch these the things. The pack 43 at the end of the beach at Omaha is still in the bunker the the the, uh, the tires have rotted off but the whole damn gun is there and it's just I just blew my mind the first time I went there and you look into this bunker and there's this bloody great pack and it's it's wow. The other th the, at the opposite end of Omaha Beach, I thought this is you have a small sort of cliff face. It's only about eight foot high, nine foot, ten foot. Anyway, I clambered up that the first time I was there, and I, and I thought, well, I wonder where this path goes. And I clambered up this trail up to the the top of the the bluffs above it. And as I came up, there's a farmer ploughing his field and is moving his tractor around all these huge bits of concrete. WN60, the Wiederstand nest right at the end of the Omaha beach at the uh, eastern end, overlooking the whole beach is all there. It's all there, it's all intact, all the bunkers. And it's, it, I stood up there and you look right the way, the panoramic view right across and you think, I can really see why this is sited exactly where it, uh, it was. And it was using using that sort of process of logic, thinking, I bet there's something up there. There's, logically, that's where I would put my defences. And you climb up this, this crappy old trail. You know, it's not signposted. And you, you, you find it by accident. And when you do, it's, it's kind of a magical moment. So one of the other things that... Uh you know, I wanted to ask you is that we talked a bit about scenarios and how battlefield walking informs perhaps more accurate scenarios. Have you thought about, uh, or do you, as a result of your walking, do you readjust what you think about rules, either for a whole period or yeah, for a particular yeah, yeah. action? Yeah, well, that's, that's a really interesting point. I mean, one of the things that I found when I was walking Konigratz a couple of years ago was, uh, it's, I mean, Konigratz is interesting. It's like, uh, you know, you, you get the Battle of Agincourt, which is on, which is on a table tennis table. You get the Battle of Waterloo, which, which is on, a, which is on, a, you know, half a football pitch, and you, and you, you get the Battle of Konigratz, and it's on, on something the size of, you know, on a colossal scale. Um, what, what I realised when I went there was how important lines of sight were. Um, because the battlefield is that battlefield is extremely undulating, so you realise that within that once once you stand in a you know dip in the field and you look around you, you're effectively in an amphitheatre almost with sort of a, a high ground you know all points around you, and you realise that the guys who were there in that wood who were shooting at the Germans up at the Prussians up in the wood opposite. They didn't know anything about the whole battlefield, you know, their leaders on the floor there, on the ground there, would have no idea what was happening outside of that discreet little part of the battlefield. And it made me realise that you can actually take an action like Koenigratz and not play it as the Battle of Koenigratz, but you can play it as the battle of this battalion in this wood with one battery of guns facing that battalion and a half in that wood uh, and actually play quite a nice little discreet action plausibly and then you have to but obviously you have to take into account that that is happening within the context of a larger battle so how does information go into that game and how does information go out of that game historically could the colonel of that battalion be in communication with his boss mm -hmm. who is well, I don't know what commanding a brigade commanding a division you you have to think about uh, how that communication is worked and how they can, I don't know, what happens if they're running short of information? What would they do? How, how would that affect the game? What happens if they want to call up reserves? How would they go through that process? How long would it take? Um, so you, you do use, the, the game does inform you about all these things which then should influence the, uh, the, the design of a game. And, and that's not so much things like weapon ranges, because weapon ranges are fairly blooming obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, we've all got the, the data as to how far a musket can fire and how accurate it was, because these tests have been going on, you know, as long as armies have been in existence. But it's the issues of command and control, and that is always the key issue about 
power set of rules fits together. As I so often say, it doesn't really matter what mechanisms you use for firing and movement, as long as you can fire and move. The thing about a set of war games rules is if you're trying to replicate the command challenges that that general commander, whatever his rank is, would have, then the whole thing is about trying to replicate the command and control experience. And walking those battlefields does make you think, blimey, can, how would I get that information? We, 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 um, we walked uh, Battlefield uh, yesterday. Some people think we're in a bit of a time machine. We're actually recording this on the second day of our trip to Belgium. We walked uh, the Ypres Comines Canal Battlefield yesterday, and it makes you think, right, OK, a company was pushed out in front of a railway line. Now, you see on the map it's a railway line. What you realise is the position a company was holding had a huge um, um, uh, railway um, bank behind it. I can't remember the word. The opposite of an embankment. Cutting. 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 A huge railway cutting behind it. But you go further down to where a B company and C company were joined up. By that, by that point, they're not in an embank. They're not. They haven't got a cutting in front of them. They've got an embankment. And if you go down towards the end of C company's position, the the embankment is so high. There's actually roads running underneath it, and it's got bridges on it. Now, without actually walking that battalion's front, you you can get an indication of that from the map. Um, but you you can't really get the full understanding of that. So when you're looking at the fact that a company has been outflanked by some German troops, you realise how that then has creates a huge problem for them extricating themselves from that position because you can understand exactly how deep that railway cutting is. Um, so just just that um, uh, you know intimate knowledge of the battlefield from having been there is what really helps you um, gain that understanding and then you can translate that into games. And one of the things is that allows you to gain that intimate knowledge is what I said earlier about allowing yourself time to actually wander around and walk the battlefield until you actually feel that you, you become orientated. So the last question probably is, uh, is battlefield walking something which is better in a group or better just with a couple of people or is it something that you kind of just do solo? Uh, does it help to have other people there bouncing ideas off or do you ever feel that you've really got to do all the work and everyone else just listen? Which is each of your preferred routes of, of going down that? That's that, actually, I think is a really interesting question. Personally, I'd rather do it on my own. And Thanks. then take... <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather do it on my own to to take the time that I want. If you're with, if you're with mates, you're going to be having a bit of chat and a bit of banter and somebody's going to go, oh, the toilet, and somebody's going to go, can, can we get a beer? Isn't it time we got a sandwich? Uh, whereas when you're on your own... Is that a reference to me? <laughs> We're looking at Nick, man. Yeah. Whereas when you're on your own, you can actually take the time that's necessary and as much time as you personally want to get yourself familiar with that and go and answer the questions that you have in your mind. However, the fun bit is then going, right, I've walked this battlefield, I know it, I'm going to go home, I'm going to write up the bits that I want to write up, I'm going to get some quotes out of the books, I'm going to decide where the stands are, and then take your mates. And that makes for, I think, uh, a fantastic social experience. And just, just sharing that information and being able to chew the fat about, you know, blimey, how could they attack through there, mm -hmm. uh, is is a positive thing because it you know some of your mates are potentially going to come up with ideas that you never had well, you well, yeah well I would say uh, I guess I would agree with that I think actually it's you do need to have the time to look at these things on your own yeah. um, now I, I would say some other things on that as well so absolutely great if you've got your own space to go and do it absolutely fantastic of course to do it with a group of mates and because of course the thing about battlefield walking is you do it in the daytime uh, and in the evening it's a nice chance to unwind and have a few beers etc so there's a whole social side of that what I would um, what I would counsel against is trying to do too much of it if you're a family man and you're on your family holiday uh, <laughs> because my kids think I'm obsessed with bridges because I'm always getting out of the car and photographing bridges um, but the tough thing is of course when you're in, when you're a family man if you're driving through France and you want to stop at a battlefield you know the, the kids the kids don't know what they're looking at. The wife certainly isn't interested. Um, Ooh, they might, yeah. Sexist remark. Well, I'm, 
<laughs> my wife isn't interested. I can tell you that for a fact. No, nor's mine. Yep. Um, and and whilst you might get them to go to a museum, a museum is not the same as going to a battlefield. It's a battlefield for a lot of kids, like my kids, is just an empty field, really. Exactly. And you've got to really, you, you, you've really got to do some preparation before, you know, even sort of talking to them about Naseby or. You know, it's just another empty field. Well, yeah. no, actually, it's not. Yeah, I took my son. So I visited Waterloo um, before last last summer in in Easter with my with a long standing friend of mine, and my son came with us, and he'd never been on a trip like this before, um, and he knew actually nothing about the Battle of Waterloo. He was seventeen, uh, and so it's quite interesting to explore what was going on for him as we were walking around. Uh, now, luckily at Waterloo, what they've got now is they've got some interactive. Uh, stuff actually on the battlefield so you can go to Hugomont where they've got the new interactive display there and you can understand a bit more about what's going on and they've got the museum of course which is on the ridge so if you can combine a museum with the battlefield that can work really well with families but a lot of the places that we go to um, so like for instance yesterday okay there's a there's a work there's a first world war graveyard and there's a, a few trenches maybe but there's nothing there for for somebody who's not really the specialist interest so you just have to be prepared to to mix it about and that can be frustrating because if you are on a family holiday um, then you know that that's that's a problem and you just think well maybe i can't get to see that this time or maybe i only get to see one or two bits of it yeah i have to say that was one of the best things about uh, normandy is it's got fabulous beaches and yeah. uh, i i went out there with my family uh when the kids were smaller I mean, my kids are in their 20s now, but uh, when they were 8, 9, 10, 11, whatever, they would love to spend the whole day on the beach, and my missus would sit there and read a book and do whatever she did, I've no idea really, uh, uh, while I wandered about climbing up and down bluffs and sticking my head in bits of concrete and so on and so forth. So uh, th there are places where you can combine the two, but I would have to say, going back to what Sid said, if I took my family to Naseby, my wife would divorce me, <laughs> and that'll be that. <laughs> uh, and and, if, and you know, um, one other thing, Sid, on, on this as well, Battlefield Touring, Battlefields tend to be fairly remote places. Mm -hmm. They are often in um, parts of the world that are now either commercialised or agricultural or not really suited to, you know, shopping experiences. Um, so it's quite hard to get food sometimes when you go battlefield oh, walking. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it sounds like a kind of silly tip, but take something to eat, yeah. take something to drink with you, because not only do you uh, not have the opportunity, but also you take up valuable time if you take too much time out to sit in restaurants and cafes. Yeah, excellent point. We found that yesterday. You know, we're in uh, we're in the heart of Belgium. We're in a first world nation, hugely civilized country. Could we find anywhere to get anything to eat? No, we spent 45 minutes looking, and then at that point we said, hold on a minute, it's November, the sun's going down in another couple of hours, and we just cracked on. By the end of yeah. the day, we were bloody starving. Yeah, now that said, if you are walking any battlefields, and you are happy to walk in Waterloo, yeah. there is a fantastic patisserie in Plants Noir. Yeah, that's, that's so very true. Yeah, that's very, very excellent, true. excellent pano chocolat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how's that, Sydney? Well, that's well that's fantastic, that's certainly answered all my questions and obviously for anyone who's listening, if you've got new, um, if you've got questions about battlefield walking, please let us know. But I think now it's time to move on as we speed across Belgium um, to think about what we're going to be, uh, what we've brought us, or talk about what we've brought us reading material. Um, so yeah, no library this week because we can't bring it with us. Well, that's been really interesting. Thanks a lot for answering those questions. Uh, clearly, as we are now speeding across Belgium, <laughs> um, we can't wander down to the Lard Island Library. So let me ask, what books have you both brought uh, for your bedtime reading to Crisis this year? Okay, um, well, funnily enough, um, the books that uh, I bought are, are related to the Battlefield tour that we did yesterday at Comines. Uh, Eat Canal action. Um, uh, there's well, there's three books that, that kind of uh, I think I think are, are pertinent. But I'll, I'll the uh, the Sea Bag Montefiore book on Dunkirk is an excellent book. He wrote that several years ago. Um, 
uh, which which is good because one of the things we've always hear about Dunkirk is the focus is always on the, um, uh, the the ships and the evacuation from the beaches. One of the things I feel that we really really miss out on is the reason that the evacuation at Dunkirk was successful was yes because of the boats but also because of guys really fighting and hard fighting hard and dying inland in order to allow the lines of uh, travel and communication to be held open uh, to allow the British Army and the parts of the French Army to to retire on to the coast and I think that that's so rarely uh, discussed that people are apt to just think well the British Army retreated and got on boats and buggered off home not like that at all the British Army had to fight like hell and the French Army had to fight like hell in order to allow <coughs> the troops to, to fall back and, and what you've got is a collapsing sack which they're trying to reduce the perimeter they're holding whilst at the same time withdrawing some troops and and you know, there were some troops who literally had to fight to the very end and die or go into German captivity uh, in order to allow other troops to escape and that's so often forgotten. Seabag Montefiore's book is the book that I always felt that I should have written because it really covers that very well. Uh, the other book that's actually specifically about the Ypres uh, Cummings Canal action is The Road to Dunkirk by Charles Moore, um, <coughs> which uh, is, is very interesting uh, and, and very specific to this action. Um, however, I think the, the, the best book for me is uh, Julian Thompson's book Dunkirk Escape to Victory, which, like the Seabank Monte Fury book, actually covers the whole uh, campaign, Fall of France campaign in uh, in the north of France and the Low Countries, um, but uh, so it actually strings together all of these little actions to give a, a broader picture and understanding of, of how that, that war was fought. And for me that is uh, the main book that uh, I'm going to enjoy uh, reading when uh, when I put my, uh, put my feet up at the end of a long hard day um, uh, playing uh, Chain of Command. So um, I've brought along uh, Peter Barton's really excellent uh, book just called Passchendaele uh, and it's a book which is published by the Imperial War Museum and it's a series of uh, um, <coughs> descriptions of all of the action around the Ypres salient from 1914 to uh, late 1917 covering Third Ypres Battle of Passchendaele um, as one of the principal themes of the book. And, and the book's really remarkable because it's got several very large panoramas which you can actually fold out within the book and they are taken from uh, the British and the German lines and it goes back to what you were saying Rich and Nick earlier about being able to visualise you know, the line of sight which is available from one part of the battlefield to another part of the battlefield. Uh, there's also quite a lot of testimony from memoirs and letters um, and orders um, which have been given by the general staff and by the uh, battlefield commanders uh, which adds a lot of colour and a lot of depth to some of the other accounts of the battle and I thought it was a really really outstanding book so we actually brought that in with, the, with us in the car um, we didn't refer to it too much but we did sort of look at some of the maps on there it's a little expensive I just looked on Amazon it's 60 pounds but for anyone who really wants to get to grips with actions in the Ypres salient I think that's one of the two or three books that is really uh, indispensable it certainly goes into uh, a lot of depth about that action which um, other sort of uh, just the sort of coffee table books just definitely don't cover and I think the nice thing about that book is that Nick could really enjoy it because it had lots of pictures which was the other reason we brought thank it thank you yeah. and I was also going to say about the pictures of course and this <laughs> ties back in again to the battlefield walkers and when you see a photo in a book it does give you an idea but actually sometimes the photos in the book you know he's got this building here which is like a tiny speck in the photo and when you're standing on the battleground and you've got that that real panorama in front of you you can get that more perspective of depth much yeah. more easily in the real thing but yeah it looks like a cracking book that one's it yeah. and what did you bring uh, Nick um, okay so well well uh, I'm I'm always want more than one so uh, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about <laughs> books sandwiches. yeah books okay but it's, uh, uh, well let's start with the battlefield theme um, and so I'm not gonna talk about one individual book but more about a series of books so there is a series of books um, 
which is called the Battleground Range from mm -hmm. Pen and Sword. Uh, and I've got the example here, I've got one for instance on Hill 60. Now these are fantastic books for battle, I mean they're great history books in their own right to be fair. Uh, and they focus on specific actions or specific engagement or specific campaigns. Um, they are, what are they, I suppose a quarter of an inch thick perhaps, something like that. Um, probably coming in at about, uh, well gosh knows how many pages, let me see, 140 or 150 pages. But in that they summarise summarise and give detail uh, of a particular engagement so the one on Hill 60 for instance uh, covers all the fighting around that area throughout the war um, and the range of these books is really quite extensive they have again fantastic maps in them uh, which if you're preparing for a battlefield tour are exactly the right kind of level you need to take uh, with you. Usually they um <clears throat> Usually they're they're, they're, they're uh, taken from the one to, to twenty five thousand range. So if you, uh, whilst those books are pretty much all in black and white, if you've gone to the uh, to, to pick up your uh, one to twenty five thousand map, it's likely it's the same map. So you can take the details from the from the book and uh, use them. That's a really good point, Nick, because one of the things we didn't really cover in our talk was you know how important it is to take books and to read books before you go on your battlefield tour. There's no point in buying the big book of D-Day, reading that and thinking it's going to furnish you with everything you need. You're not. You're going to have to, uh, <clears throat> you're going to, have to read you know, multiple volumes on it really to, to get a, a real impression before you go. Yeah, um, and, and um, I mean some of them certainly do include that aspect of how you actually <laughs> tour the battlefield as well. So with suggested yeah. stands and routes that you can follow. Yeah. And, they are, and they are superb. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, these, you know, we say you can't take a load of books with you, but actually the books you can take, this is one of them. It's a small book, it will fit in a knapsack, you can carry it with you. And generally throughout the text, it's interspersed with accounts and narrative uh, that enables you to put that personal feel on it. So, you know, the, the, the range is extensive. Uh, you know, they are an excellent range of books. And they retail at something of, I don't know, about sort of 16, about 17 tenor, quid. Don't they? Something like that. Tenor, tenor on eBay, eBay Depends which ones me. you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Certainly, second hand, you could probably pick them up for less than that. Uh, but they're an essential part of your library. So, oh, that's, so oh, more of a range, but Sydney, but not just one book, not just a range of books. I'm going to talk about another book as well because we're focusing here on the Western Front. And I was very conscious that uh, this weekend we're off to um, Antwerp. Uh, but a hundred years ago this weekend was when my great uncle, Sergeant Albert Skinner, was killed in Palestine fighting the Turks. And I thought it was just worth mentioning, seeing as we are on the Western Front, uh, worth mentioning of course that there's a, a lot of history, a lot of fighting went on in other fronts, and particularly in Palestine and the Egyptian <coughs> Expeditionary Force. So um, I'd also like to highlight uh, the book by A.P. Wavell, The Palestine Campaigns, which was, Wavell of course was a general during the uh, 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 during the First World War fought on the, on the Western Front and also as part of the, the Egyptian Expeditionary Force and did work in Palestine after the First World War as well. And his account is a good opener to the Palestine campaign. Uh, it starts off with the Turkish attacks on the Suez Canal and then follows the story of the um, of the uh, slow advance in, through Sinai and into Palestine, the failed battle of first Gaza, uh, second Gaza, and then on to third Gaza, uh, where and the fighting to the inland, in fact, the, the the hook, if you like, that went inland from Gaza, which was where my where my relative was killed. So I thought, well, since we're on the on the Western Front, it was worth paying homage to that, and particularly with it being a hundred years ago to the day that his battalion was involved in fighting around Tal al Khulwife uh, and uh, an early morning assault there uh, during which they suffered horrendous casualties in terrible, terrible hot conditions. Um, I just wanted to flag that up really and, and, and say that that is a good book and, and highly recommend it. That sounds absolutely fantastic. So finally, I'd normally ask at this point what you've got coming up in the hobby, uh, but I think we all know that crisis is a big event which is uh, going to be almost here, but it's going to be tomorrow. So I'm going to come. I'm going to simply say, what are you two most looking forward to at Crisis in Antwerp this year? Having a beer. Having a beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, the, the the trip to Crisis is not just about a trip to a war game show. It's about a trip to Antwerp. I, I, 
I can't tell you how much I enjoy the annual pilgrimage uh, to Antwerp because it's a fabulous city and um, the, the, the guys at the Tin Soldiers of Antwerp Club are fantastic hosts. It is a wonderful show. It's a great opportunity to um, see games of the sort that we don't see uh, on the UK uh, Wargame Show circuit. You know, there are clubs that come over from Germany, there are clubs that come up from France, clubs that come down from Holland. On the, on the Wargame cir Show circuit in, in, in the UK, you tend to see the same games doing their, doing their circle. Um, and when you come here, you see some really different, fresh, interesting games. And for me, I get a lot of inspiration from, uh, from seeing guys like the Dortmund War Games Club, who uh, every year produce a fantastic looking game. I mean, that, the, the, they did an AWI game uh, about 10 years ago, which absolutely still sticks in my mind as one of the most beautiful war games I have ever seen. Uh, so, uh, it's, the games are of a standard that uh, remind me of the wow factor that games used to have when uh, when I was a youngster going to war game shows, I don't know how good they were, but in those days, you know, I, it it was like a sort of Christmas Day opening the presents. Wow, uh, and that's I still get that at Antwerp, and it's not something I get at many shows, to be honest with you. So uh, the the just the quality of the games that are at Antwerp is, is what I'm really most looking forward to, as well as the beer. Fantastic. So Nick, how about uh, you? Uh, well, I'd echo, I'd echo all of that. You know? The great thing about Antwerp in particular is, is you'd think that um, you're going overseas and there will be language issues associated with that. Do you know what? I have more conversations with more people when we come to crisis than I do when I go 15 yards from my own front door. Well, at least uh, you're you know, wanted going, posters yeah, aren't up in Antwerp. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, so people come to the stand, come to, come to the games, uh, we're, we're running participation games so people have a chance to play the game, but also yeah, it's a chance to talk to people. It's that it's that social thing. So uh, names that you recognise from from discussion groups or Twitter feeds or whatever, you get a chance to meet the guy behind the badge. Now that's not always a good thing, but generally, <laughs> generally you yeah. get a chance to actually have a, a proper conversation with people about a topic that you both love. Yeah. yeah uh, so it's yeah. a real there's a real feeling of, of community that goes with the crisis yeah. show, and I love that. Yeah. I also know however that, uh, that by the time we get to tomorrow afternoon at, at half past four or five o'clock that my feet are going to be absolutely killing me <laughs> uh, that my voice is going to have gone and that all i would fancy is a nice tubular a nice beer just to just to cool my throat down a bit and to relax into the evening. Wash the dust away, yeah. that's right. And we'll probably have more than one jubilee if well, we're on this moment. <laughs> right. I couldn't possibly come in. No. <laughs> yeah. no. Sydney, I mean, you, you you, know, this is your, uh, I don't know how many times you've been to the show now. It must but be about the seventh you know, or sixth time, I can't remember which. But I think that, uh, I'd echo everything that you two guys have said, I think it's a super friendly show. It's a great opportunity to meet up with um, war gamers that you know aren't in the, based in the United Kingdom, and this is the main opportunity that I think we have to go over to Belgium and, and do that and meet people from all around Europe. I think the other thing is that uh, the other star of the show is the city of Antwerp, which is absolutely mm. a fantastic city, yeah. a beautiful yeah. old town. Yeah, it's a fabulous. fantastic restaurant, and it's an extremely friendly place. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. So if you haven't fabulous been, get your, get your backside over here yeah. next year yeah. and enjoy some fantastic gaming. Yeah, and enjoy cool. the traffic on the Antwerp Ring Road, which is which which is, is uh, which we've enough. just arrived in. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. So great. We're, we're, we're back parked in the, in the middle lane of the Antwerp Ring Road at the moment. <laughs> so we so thank you again for listening to the podcast. I think if uh, you have any questions, please email us or drop onto the Lard Island News site and paste post a comment, um, which will be in the post where the um, the uh, podcast is embedded. Um, is there anything else, guys, that we need to mention to people? Uh, well, I need to make a bit of room for the band so the band can do Yeah, well, well that's right. We haven't told you that Roger and the boys are in the boot of the car and they're going to play us out. So, right. over to you, Roger.
Uh, here we are at the Menning Gate. Uh, it's 25 past seven in the evening and there are crowds here already anticipating the arrival of the buglers of the Belgian Volunteer Fire Service, service to play the last post. And I'm just uh, struck by the sheer scale of this structure atop by a sarcophagus and the words which may in many ways seem corny now but have so much meaning to those of us who uh, have any comprehension of what went on here to the armies of the British Empire who stood here from 1914 to 1918 and to those of their dead who have no known grave it's uh, quite incredible to see all the names etched into the walls of the main gate itself and to realize that every one of those had a family to whom the loss meant well uh, just so much that you can't really even put it into words but whose sacrifice was for a greater good which was the freedom of the peoples of Britain and the Empire and of course of Europe uh, it's uh, it's impossible to say anything more than the fact that it is a very moving place to be indeed and to see so many people here and to see so many young people many of whom have come from schools around the United Kingdom and also schools around Belgium and uh, Europe to see that on a, on a kind of unimportant evening on the, I don't know what day we are, the, the second, third of November, that all these people are here to see a tribute to those who gave their lives a hundred years ago. Well, I don't know, but for me, that's a really very, very special thing. We'll just, just take a moment to just listen to the crowds here and then uh, me probably blowing my nose. <laughs> In many ways this is a modern Tower of Babel with so many languages being spoken within such a short distance. We've walked about 10 yards, we've heard people with five, six, seven, eight different languages. I'm looking at a plaque here, the 9th Boal Corps, Major Jones, Captain Eltinger, but Subedar, by Injanath Kit Singh. We're looking at Nuttall, O'Brien, O'Connor, O'Connor, O'Hagan, O'Neill, Stark, Stevens, Stevenson, Stevens, Claxburn, Clacton, Codrington, and these are by regiment, the King's Liverpool Regiment. The plaque to the King's Liverpool Regiment is 20, 30 foot high. The, and it goes over into another, into another column, the Norfolk Regiment. There must be hundreds of names. My God, another column to the King's Liverpool Regiment. And another. <laughs> And another, and then the Royal Fusiliers. Here are recorded the names of officers and men who fell in Ypres Salient, but to whom the fortunes of war denied the known and honored burial giving to their comrades in debt. <laughs> 